Welcome to A Different Atheist Reads, A History of God by Karen Armstrong. I'm Christy Winters. In the last two videos, what I've done is laid out Karen Armstrong's theological perspective and my atheistic counter to her perspective so that you know where we're both coming from as we go through the book. What I would like to do in this final video is present some characteristics and attributes of God that I think will be helpful as we work through to care, compare and contrast the, concept, the conceptualization of God uh, by people over time. Now, I think I've been a little bit sloppy in my language in the last couple of videos. I think I've used the term theory and I've used attributes and I've used concepts. So before we move on, uh, I want to say that when I say a theory of God, I don't mean a series of interrelated statements that describe some sort of external event that happens a, a causal relationship that we can make a prediction about in in the empirical sort of world. That's that's not what I mean by theory um, and I hope that's a pretty good off-the-cuff definition of theory. What I mean in terms of the theory of God bringing to the, the book is more about the way that noticing the way people put together the concepts of God. So I would say that each person, based on the attributes that they pick up and their value system and the way they put them together, they're giving us their functioning notion of God um, as, a, as a workable sort of model uh, that represents their understanding. And that's probably not a great use of theory. I'll see if I can come up with something a little bit better. But until then, let's go ahead and look at attributes that are commonly attributed to God and their counterparts, because it's uh, not enough to just say God is eternal, because in some ways in the Bible, God is presented as, as being temporal. And we need to be as sensitized to both of these two things to see how people use God, the concept of God, in different ways. So uh, what I did was I went to a website, a Bible website, and just looked at the attributes that they attributed, uh, and they're all the, the really cool, omni, eternal ones, and then also came up with the antonyms, or a counterposition to, to those attributes. And I think when we look at them, we're actually going to be able to come up with examples of how both um, a positive and its antonym are represented in, in the Bible. And I'm going to break these down, these attributes of God, into three sections. The first one is of seven characteristics, and these characteristics speak more to the way that God exists, um, his sort of fundamental nature. I might slide into a gendered pronoun, I should say, and say God, he, but I know that if I'm being honest to Karen Armstrong's perspective, I would probably say it um, rather than he. But forgive me for any sort of slips of the tongue. Um, so we've got these uh, I've got seven characteristics that go to the nature of God and sort of the being. Then I've got three characteristics I've, I've put under the phrase moral correctness, um, and uh, you'll see what those are when we get to them. The last one is moral emotions, or, or yeah, ex like empathetic experiences that, that we value. So I'll explain a bit more as we go along, but let's start with the first one in terms of the nature of God. So within these, uh, my, sub set, my subcategory of, of seven of them, we've got eternal, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, immutability, self-existence, which I'm also going to classify as monotheism, and transcendence. So starting from, from the beginning, eternal obviously meaning existing throughout time and not being bound by time. An opposite to this would be God being a temporal being and located in, within a, a temporal t frame. For an example of this in the Bible, we can look at the second account of creation in Genesis, which starts, I think, about Genesis 2-4. These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth, and when they were created, in the day that the Lord made the heaven and the earth. So. Um, sorry, made the earth and the heaven. So God seems to be fixed within time in that story, which is, is different from saying that God is eternal. And again, we discussed in the last video God existing outside of time and space and why I, I find that conceptually difficult um, and logically contradictory, so no point in going over it again. But if you haven't watched it, um, maybe go and check that out. The next idea is God being un omnipotent, being completely, and I define that as being completely unconstrained in doing whatever it is that God wants to do. 
Uh, an example of uh, the counter to that is obviously any kind of external constraint or pre presumably internal constraint that would limit God's power in any way. And perhaps a, a good example, less from a Bible text and more just from people's real life, is the problem of evil. If God is all-powerful and doesn't want people to suffer, yet suffering exists, why does God, who is all-powerful, why does God allow that suffering when God could fix it in an instant? So that's omnipotence versus a constrained or limited power. Omniscience, perfect knowledge of everything at every moment in time, forever and ever and ever. Uh, and that is countered with any kind of ignorance, anything that God would not know about, right? An example of God's not being omniscient in the Bible would, again, going back to the creation story, be when God was walking in the cool of the day and he called out to Adam, where are you? As if God didn't know. And you can have different interpretations, that's fine, uh, just from a reading of the text, you wouldn't infer God's omniscience if you had that passage. You kind of have to bring all your God stuff with you and contextualize that story in order to make that inference, but the inference isn't there in the text. The next one I want to discuss is uh, omnipresence. The idea that God is everywhere at all times um, and exists everywhere. The counter to that is that uh, right back, going right back to the early polytheism of, of Judaism and, and that area would be the idea that gods are local, gods are geographical, gods are even spatial. And that when God, that the idea that gods are actually physically tied to the lands. And an example of this is, it comes from, from the Psalms, how can we sing to you the praises of the Lord Jehovah in a foreign land? So when there was the Babylonian exile, one of the big crises of faith was by exiling an entire group of people who believed in a God that was tied to that land, you were essentially exiling them from their God. You were physically removing them from where their God resided. And we know from reading, I think it was in Deuteronomy, that once uh, the Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy, <laughs> once um, Deuteronomy was discovered, it was stated that all sacrifices had to be made in Jerusalem. So, you know, on the one hand, you have the idea of God is omnipresent. On the other, you have the idea of God as being local and spatial. Immutability is the characteristic of being unchanging, an unchanging God, and obviously a God that changes God's mind or does something in the past and then regrets it would be an example of a God that was not immutable. Self-existence and monotheism, that I mean that God exists on by God's own will, God self-exists, um, and if you come at it from a, a typically monotheistic point of view, God would not make other gods, right? So that's why I'm, I'm kind of putting these concepts together. Existing with other gods would obviously be the counter to this. Um, if we look in the, again, going back to creation, it, it's a nice uh, source because it's a very early belief system. Now, God, now man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Who is the us? Um, and so, again, there are, there are theological answers to that question, but just by reading the passage straight, you couldn't infer, say, the Trinity from that passage. So, looking at my clock, I see that we're down to a minute, and I didn't know it would take quite so long to get through all these concepts. So I'm going to finish up with transcendence, and then I'll finish uh, the other characteristics in the next video. So it ends up being a two-parter. Um, transcendent is the final nature characteristic I want to discuss, and that's the idea of God being sort of above and beyond, um, distant, uh, you know, not accessible the way that we can access reality. And the counter to that is that God is a very personal God. And if we look at uh, Abraham in, in the Jewish scriptures, what we see is a very interpersonal relationship between God and a believer. So, uh, with that in mind, I'm going to continue on in the next video discussing moral correctness and um, moral emotions attributed to God and their counterpoints. And then we can finally get on to the book. All right, this has been um, me doing A History of God. I'll see you on the other side. And what I want to do in this final video is just go over the attributes and their antonyms in what I have 
put together as the moral dimensions of God. The first one being moral correctness. And maybe if I just list off the first three um, in this sort of moral correctness category, you'll see how they hang together. There's the holiness, uh, God is holy, God is righteous, and God is just. So you can kind of see how those kind of uh, hang together. And the antonyms of those, I would say that the opposite of, of holy is, is profane, not like in a swear word kind of way, but more like a spiritual profanity. We can also think of uh, sort of the ritual purity, when being pure and impure. In, in and there's righteousness, and I've countered that with unjustified. Not unjust, unjustified as an excuse, but more like um, God being or God being righteous, meaning God is sort of rightness itself, and anything that that goes um, outside of that you can't is unjustified. Uh, not a great series, but. I think that that's more something that we need to deal with um, a little bit closer to the, the Christianity um, rather so much with, with righteousness because people and God are righteous in the Jewish scriptures. Noah was righteous and uh, Abraham was righteous. So I'll, this comes from a Christian Bible site, so righteousness as a characteristic of God obviously is one that Christians hold slightly differently from what we see in the text of the Jewish scriptures. Then we've got justice. God is just. Uh, I, I don't know if that's like a, a, a God is justice or justice is inherently part of the nature of God so God cannot not be just or something. Um, but anyway, justice is an attribute that is put in onto God and then there's also unjust. Things can be unjust and we see that all the time. So don't need too much of an explanation of what injustice is. The final three characteristics that we'll use to compare um, are what I call moral emotions. And I call them moral emotions because they are basically kind of based in, in empathy or in a evaluation um, uh, of, of what we would say is, is human goodness. So one of these moral emotions is goodness itself, what it is to be good, and anything I would put outside of goodness is anything that's morally questionable. All right, so there's positive, and then maybe there's neutral, and there's negative. So anything that is morally questionable is, is not good. Then there's mercy, the notion of, of being merciful and its antonym, which is being merciless. And the final characteristics from this Bible website were uh, was love, that God is love. And obviously the antonym for that would be any kind of hate or contempt possibly even apathy. Um, it depends on how expansive you want to make your antonyms. So when we go through the book and we're looking at, for instance, uh, the early Jewish writings, we can take this framework of attributes and say, well, if we look at this particular author's depiction in the text, we can see that Abraham is worshiping uh, a, a god that is not monotheistic, it's not self-existing, it's a, it's a polytheistic worldview that Abraham is holding, and that God is temporal, God is, exists in, in a particular place, and God is personal. So God's not transcendent in this story, rather he's actually having a conversation with somebody. And I think by organizing it, again, um, into these different categories, we can see how different authors take attributes of God, perhaps at different times within the same work, or within their own writings, in order to create a functioning model of God that they take and then present in their in their writings. So we actually get to move on to the introduction now. I guess I bet you guys are really excited. I know I am, um, but I also think that it was really important to to lay the groundwork for this and that it will pay off in the long run. So thanks for sticking with me this far. We can actually now get into the book. So exciting. Um, and I'll see you guys next time. So thanks again for watching. Bye. God's sort of nature in terms of what it means to be God omnipotent, uh, omnipotent, I guess I could say it either way.